Chapter 15 A Shot in the Dark Don't put me in jail, Chet pleaded. He visualized himself spending the summer behind bars. Please, Chief, if I go to jail, I won't be able to get pictures of the criminals. The man raised his eyebrows, and the police officer exchanged questioning glances. The chief leaned far over his desk and shook a finger at Chet. If there are any pictures of criminals to be taken, you'd better leave it to the police, he stormed. I take it you're one of General Smith's guests, he added a little less sternly. Yes, sir, Chet answered. Well, I'm going to let you go this time, but only on one condition. No more atom crackers before the 4th of July. Yes, sir. The boy sighed with relief. As Chet was leaving, the chief called out to him. Will you be seeing General Smith tonight? Yes, sir. Tell him that a woman called here a little while ago and warned us to pick up Dr. Bush if he came around. She wouldn't give us her name. Chet told the chief that a similar request had come to the Hardys in Bayport. We're searching for Randolph and those other two, the chief said. You boys keep your eyes open, too. We sure will, Chet promised as he left. On the sidewalk, he came face to face with the Hardys, who were out of breath from running. You all right, Chet? Frank painted. We heard a bombardment. What happened? Who started it? I did. What? I learned that you shouldn't shoot off atom crackers here before the 4th of July. (laughs) With much laughter, the Hardys finally got Chet's story straight. He also told them about the woman's phone call. There was no doubt in anyone's mind that Bush was in the vicinity. But who, Frank and Joe wondered, was the mysterious woman? The boys decided to discuss the matter at the house. I got my pictures, Chet beamed. Let's see them, Frank said. Chet pulled the packet from his pocket and held all the photos under a streetlight. Of all the snaps that the boy had taken, only a few had proved clear enough to print. One showed the old museum, and another the ruins of the plantation. A third, a hawk, which Chet had snapped midair. What's this funny-looking thing? Joe asked, holding up another print. Gee, I don't know, Chet scratched his head. It's upside down, Frank remarked. Now I see it, Chet bubbled. I must have taken this when I was backed into the well hole. Look, there's the guy who was spying on me. He pointed to the thick mass of foliage. You're right, Frank agreed. There are the man's back and shoulders and part of his legs. Another half man, Chet moaned. Say, Joe's eyes lit up. I wonder if this is the same man you got a picture of in Bayport. We'll soon find out, Chet said, pulling the duplicate of the stolen print from his pocket. The legs seem to match, Joe observed. At least now we know that Bush has not only long legs, but has high square shoulders. If only I'd gotten his face, Chet groaned. Don't worry, Frank offered encouragingly. We have two strikes on Bush now. Next time you'll get his face. As Chet put all of his photographs into the envelope, Joe went across the street to buy some more atom crackers. He returned in a few minutes with a bag full. Let me see him, Chet begged. <laughs> no siree, Joe insisted, shoving the bag into his pocket. These are for the fourth. Upon reaching the house, Chet related the experience in town to the general. The officer laughed heartily at the story of the atom crackers, but he frowned upon hearing of the woman's phone call. With Bush and his gang still around, we're going to have to be prepared for anything. Later that night, the boys decided to take a drive around the Central area. The stars were clear, and the air felt refreshingly cool as they leisurely toured the countryside in the open convertible. On the way home, Frank decided to go past the old Beauregard Smith plantation. Soon they were approaching the overgrown lane which led them into the property. Well, tonight I can get a good solid sleep, Chet yawned. No more sleuthing until tomorrow. Don't be too sure, 
Frank said, slowing down. I just saw a light flash in there. Let's see what's going on. As he pulled to the side of the road, Chet grunted and announced that he would guard the car while the Hardys went to investigate. Sure, fall asleep and be kidnapped, Joe teased. You'd better come along. But I'm tired, fellas. Chet reluctantly agreed and brought up the rear as the boys, unlighted flashlight in hand, walked silently and cautiously toward the spot where Frank had seen a light. The clear, star-studded sky made it easy for them to find their way. When they reached the front of the mansion's ruins, Chet flopped down on the granite stepping stone. He yawned, and his head flopped down onto his ample chest. No light was visible, but there were muffled sounds. Somebody's digging, Joe whispered. For the lost gold, I'll bet, Chet came to life. Let's rush him. We'd better wait here a while, Frank advised. Nobody can see us, but we may be able to pick up some useful information. The boys strained their ears. A thud sounded emptily in the distance, and then another. Suddenly, Chet sneezed. In the stillness, the sound seemed magnified a hundred times. The the thud stopped. Quick, move to another place, Frank ordered. They've spotted us. As he grabbed Chet by the arm and pulled him roughly from his perch on the stepping stone, a flash winked in the distance and the sound of a rifle shot scattered the stillness. I'm hit, Chet cried out, falling to the ground. Where? In the leg! Chet writhed in pain. Apprehension gripped the hardies. Had their friend been badly wounded? It would take both of them to carry him to their car. Meanwhile, what about the diggers? First things first, Frank said, gritting his teeth. Forgetting all other problems, the brothers hauled Chet to his feet and put an arm over each of their shoulders. At a safe distance from the riflemen, they laid him on the ground. Hurry, get me to a doctor, Chet moaned. Frank, using his body to shield the beam from his flashlight, bent low to examine the wound. Blood oozed from right above the right knee, but there was only a long, deep scratch on Chet's leg. You weren't shot, Chet, Frank tried to conceal his grin. You've scratched your leg on the stepping stone. Hold on, I'll bandage it. I'm not shot, Chet asked as he sat up and surprised. Are you disappointed, Joe asked. I guess not. Chet replied as Frank bound the wound with a clean handkerchief. And then he added, Thanks, fellas. Didn't mean to scare you like that. Forget it, Frank said. And he turned to his brother. Joe, put an ear to the ground. The blonde boy obeyed. Receding footsteps told him that there were at least two enemies. And then dull thuds made it evident that they'd gone back to their work. Come on. Let's find that guy who shot at us. Right. Chet, you stay here till we get back. But they're armed, Chet argued. You haven't got a chance against them. We'll be careful, Frank promised. We have to find out who they are and what they're up to. With that, the Hardys slipped into the darkness, circling toward the spot from which the rifle flash had come. End of chapter 15.